So we're going to look at uh, the discarded image, third lecture on this. And uh, I realized when prepping it and going through it, I thought I, I needed way more <laughs> than three to do it uh, adequately. But um, I can't get to the course material, uh, the things that I actually want to get to uh, if I don't do some of this. So uh, something's better than nothing, but I, I do think that I've overlooked uh, and uh, uh, probably misrepresented some of the material here. But you can read it for yourself. And I'm, I'm only going to try and draw your attention to some of the things that I think are uh, helpful to your reading of other uh, works by Lewis. Uh, so in reflection on uh, last class, <coughs> when we were talking about uh, these triads, uh, and and triads in terms of there's the there's nature which is the um, the realm below the earth below the moon and then uh, sky or the heavens being what is up above them and then there's this realm in between called uh, an e the ether um, and uh, so there's the the nature then there's the air and then there's the ether above that ether being the realm in which the heavenly beings reside. In the whole medieval model, there are these dichotomies, and yet there's these, there are these third things in between them that populate uh, the cosmos. So there are beings that reside between the heavenly beings, like the angels, and human beings. And these are, the, uh, among other things, the longevity that he is going to talk about. And I'll, uh, I will briefly uh, discuss today, but not at great length, because I want to speak uh, to some of the processes of the human mind and the human frame and the soul that he talks about because I think these are actually really important for his later work in apologetics. And I know some of you are uh, very interested in that in particular. Uh, but these, uh, these chapters in which he's talking about these beings of various, under various names. So think of his Narnia Chronicles, all of the talking beasts. Um, but also not just the talking beasts, which we know as normal animals, like a talking horse, fine. But then there are all the figures that populate Greek mythology, which he also includes in, uh, think of the Narnia Chronicles, like dryads and fauns and nymphs uh, and elves and centaurs and so forth. He, he also refers to them and talks about their nature here in these sections. And it, so it's it's interesting to get his rationale for why this is. Now clearly what they have come from, and there's no doubting this, is the medieval model that he's talking about. And he's quite explicit then, <coughs> if you've read any of his work, that he is more or less presenting uh, in his Narnia Chronicles something like the medieval model. And just uh, assuming for imaginative purposes its legitimacy in his own fiction. And that's, there's something about the character of his fiction which uh, I think everyone who reads it has a sense of, which is that the author uh, has more than a sense of having creative, created beings out of his imagination that never existed. He seems to be talking about things that uh, were once referred to and he thinks still have uh, in some way an existence and a reality to them. <coughs> but the nature in which he depicts them is, is interesting. And uh, to some degree, he doesn't follow the medieval model because he humanizes uh, these beasts uh, as well, gives them uh, rational souls almost. Not just, so we'll, we'll get into the discussion of the soul. Uh, but uh, in the animal uh, creatures, they would have sentient souls and uh, vegetable souls, but not rational souls. But, but Lewis's uh, beings have all three. They have a vegetable soul, a, a sensitive soul, and a rational soul. Um, and maybe these other uh, demons, the daemones that he's discussing, had those as well. Uh, but uh, I think that his whole discussion of that is useful and helpful for uh, trying to understand uh, his whole uh, uh, fic fictive work. And as I say, when we come to his apologetics, I think his discussion of reason and understanding and the way in which they operate is, is also quite helpful and how they fit together with the imagination 
because really what he describes in the medieval model is a um, something that has been flipped on its head in our era in the 18th century, particularly in Immanuel Kant. If you've read Kant's critique of pure reason, he talks about um, something like a Coper he's proposing a Copernican shift in the mind whereby objects will no lo we will no longer look at the world outside us and expect that the world is as we perceive it, but rather let's think of about it the other way that objects will conform to our capacity to perceive it. So it's the subjective turn, the Copernican turn as he presents it. Now what Kant presents there is really something that Lewis is going to describe as characteristic of the 18th century, this increasing distrust in certitudes and an increasing trust in reason, which is just a process of, of thinking. So it gets rid of all certitudes. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later uh, towards the end. Uh, but I didn't conclude, I think, altogether with Boethius. And I wanted to say a little bit about uh, that before I move on to the cosmology that he speaks of, because his cosmology is central to understanding uh, the, the sort of the broad picture of what's going on in the Narnia Chronicles, his portrait of the heavens, and so forth. But I, I will come to that in a second. <coughs> I, where did I leave it off here? I'm not sure even the page number exactly. Uh, 85? Oh, thank you very much. Okay. So he, uh, back in 85, he said, uh, and he, the gambit that uh, Boethius gives to Lady philosophy, which he assumes, and all medievals would assume, is that, and I'll just repeat this then, that all perfect things are prior to all imperfect things. And we being imperfect then, <coughs> as a consequence, it has a view of, uh, on human nature then, right? Since there are things that are perfect and prior to us, namely God, the angels, etc., we who are imperfect cannot attain perfection. There's, that's a sort of an implication of it. And there's, so perfectibility or the dominion mandate of Adam and Eve given in the garden isn't there to become something that we're not. It's, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a recovery project. So in Milton's treatise of education, he, he says that the aim of education is to restore the ruins of our first parents by learning to know God aright. That's the aim of education. It's simply to recover what was lost. It's not to endeavor to gain totally new knowledge and knowledge that's never been thought of or considered before. That's not even in the scope of education. It's holding on to the certitudes of the past, making connections and knowing things, that the picture exactly and understanding it and living within the context of that. Whereas come the age of modern science, as I said to you last time, the motto of the Royal Society is nullius in verba, nothing, uh, take no one's word for it. So there are no certitudes. It's very much going into a frontier, think of the analogy <coughs> like used in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, of going into a frontier that is uh, forbidding to mankind, nobody's been there before, and exploring it and bringing it under our dominion. So modern science very much seeks to do that. It pushes the frontiers. It goes beyond them. Same with space exploration. That's the context of modern sci-fi sci uh, works, is exploring something which had hitherto been unexplored. Or you can talk about going down to the depths of the ocean, so forth. That, but that same sort of thing, conquering the world, going and doing entirely novel things. Um, that is not part of the medieval mindset at all. But also with that, there is a sense of uh, restlessness in the modern spirit, which isn't there in the medieval spirit. The medieval spirit is very much at home in the world, in the sense that it feels like uh, that it is a part of something that's already perfect, as in God is ruling over it. And we need not fix it utterly, whereas modern science has no such certitude. There's a, uh, an anxiety there, and it's expressed in the view of the cosmos, which I will get to in a minute. But that statement by Boethius, <coughs> he, Lewis said, 
was common ground to nearly all ancient and medieval thinkers, except the Epicureans. And they're a marginal school of philosophy, historically, the Epicureans. <coughs> so the aim of the medieval mind is to contemplate uh, God in his simplicity. That is the greatest beatitude, is to behold the blessedness of God. And theology would be aimed at doing that philosophy likewise. That's what Plato sought to do, to, to perceive the forms uh, in Plato's conception, in, in the Christian conception, to behold God, which is not possible, obviously, but that's the aim, to get closer to that. And I began it, uh, when we talked about the uh, abolition of man with Plato's uh, uh, allegory of the chariot, that is the aim of the intellectual life, is to get a as close to the heavenly as possible and just to behold it. And thereby you're obtaining something that is already perfect and that thereby you are making yourself more perfect <coughs> in the process. And the good man and the good life is aimed at achieving a perfection that already exists and just grasping it and then living in accordance with it. It's a, so it's a big shift. But that's what Boethius uh, says. And then he goes on to say, uh, in response to the complaint, that there is apparent injustice. So nature is regular. It obeys what we now call laws. Lewis says, actually, in the medieval period, they called it I inclinations. It, it, it inclines that way, but they're not laws. Laws is an anthropomorphism, right? As if the natural world was a person who obeyed something. It's, a, it's, it's interesting, just the conception of the law of grav gravity. People obey laws. Animals don't obey laws. They, for example, they don't obey the traffic laws. <coughs> you know, the, uh, your animal run across the street and go run over, by, run over by a truck. It's not because they're not obeying the laws. It's because they don't recognize the laws. They're not people. So he, he, it's an interesting observation, just the language of a law in, in nature. It's rather an inclination that is an unbreakable, uh, un, unbreakable one. All things tend towards something. And the explanation for that is love. Love moves all things. But in response to this idea, how about the injustice of human affairs? So Bo Boethius, if you recall, is in prison. He's done nothing wrong. He's, he's, he's dealing with the problem that... Um, befuddles and distresses the psalmists as well. Why is it that bad men in this world seem to prosper and the good often seem to be punished and not to flourish? How come? How is this so? So here's his response. It's all justice. It's the unexpected thing. He's not trying to explain away the apparent contradictions. It is all justice. The good are always rewarded and the wicked always punished by the mere fact of being what they are, which is an interesting response. So the superficial external appearances, ignore those. The good are good and they're being rewarded for their goodness by virtue of the fact that they are good, which is the ultimate reward because God himself is good. So that's the certitude. So if we are good, it's not, we don't do it for the reward of goodness. We do it because good is its own, goodness is its own reward. Evil power and evil performance, I'm reading directly from Lewis here on 86, are the punishment of evil will. And it will be infinite since the soul is immortal. That's Boethius. Interestingly, then that means that worldly success and the praise of the world can actually be a, a false indicator of, of true success. So that's his first thing, and he, and he acknowledges, it is strange to see the wicked flourishing and the virtuous afflicted. Why, yes, replies Lady Philosophy, everything is strange until you know the cause. And then what is the cause? Well, we can look at that. But the second gambit that Lady Philosophy makes in response to the apparent injustice of the vicissitudes of life, so the fact that good people get cancer, that good people s seem to suffer unjustly and so forth, just like the evil do, if not even more so. Second response, 
in the citadel of the divine simplicity is providence when seen from below mirrored in the multiplicity of time and space is destiny now there's a difference between providence and destiny we see it as destiny we had no choice right it, it was so well of course because that's how we've received it it could not have been otherwise once we've received whatever has happened in life a, an accident or whatever it could not have been otherwise so it seems like it had to be so there was no way of escaping it there was no freedom right but seen from above from God's vantage point this is providence and there was a possibility there but God chose it to be this way so there there is goodness in it it's not merely the evil if it were only from the perspective of fate or destiny as the Greeks saw it it would only be an evil thing it could not have been otherwise you had no choice but actually if you see it from God's perspective there was providence in this there is a purpose to the consequences that you have received however much however evil they might seem uh, from the world's perspective and, and particularly in comparison to others and as in a wheel the nearer we get to the center the less motion we find so every finite being in proportion as he comes nearer to participating in the divine unmoving nature becomes less subject to destiny which is merely a moving image of eternal providence so the closer you come to God and this is the purpose of affliction is to draw you closer to the thing that can't be moved and so you are actually being blessed by the very fact that you are you are moving away from the idea of, of being fated or destined to receive what you are to it actually being a part of God's providence. You, you were brought to the, the still point. As I say, in the middle of a wheel, it's not moving very fast. On the outer periphery, it seems to be moving very fast and seems to have no purpose. It's just hitting you like a wave. Now that becomes really important in that, just that imaginative concept becomes important in Lewis's fiction. And that's what he is as much as anything concerned about in this whole discarded image, by the way, because he, when he comes to the epilogue, and I'm saying it right now because I may not get to it at the end, um, he says, having said everything that I've written here, it will be responded, but of course the medieval model, as much as you like it and as, much, as beautiful as you find it, it's not true. <laughs> and he says, that's correct. That's, I, I concede that. It's not true. It's an exploded way of looking at things. It, it doesn't hold. But, but, there are consequences to that and particularly in terms of the way we live life that he wants to explore and thinks is, are important. And he also wants to, I think, disabuse the, uh, the reader and the modern uh, thinker that the way the medievals thought about things were they were total ignoramuses and there was no purpose to it and it was just being guided by authoritarian individuals in the church you know using their position and authority for selfish purposes or something like that like it's so it's useful even on that front <coughs> but still so we say that the wicked flourish and I'll finish with this and the innocent suffer but we do not know who are the wicked and who are the innocent still less what either need so all luck seen from the center is good and medicinal if you see it from the center in other words from the providential side of things everything that you receive is medicinal because God himself is good if you see it from the hub of course you either think that you if it's a good thing that you deserved it and then you you become proud which is actually to your spiritual ruin or on the other hand you think that you're being dealt an injustice in which case you think that God's not good which is also harmful to your soul so the purpose of this is to draw you closer to the center to the fixed point so that's the consolation of philosophy now this is a philosophical argument it's not even a Christian one it's 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 coherent and it stands philosophically on its own. Boethius was a Christian, but he thought that this was a good apologetic for it. I think it is myself in different ways. Um, but I left off with that, and I, I wanted to make the distinction also, and this is also important, 
e eternity, which is the realm in which God operates, is distinct, this is 89, from perpetuity, I remember saying this now, from the mere endless continuance in time. So my son wants to profess that he loves me more than his sister does, because there's always a little fight going on. And, and she s says that she loves me infinity or something like that, because it's infinite, okay. And his response is that he loves me infinity plus 99. Yeah. Not understanding what infinity is, but he sees it as, but he sees it more as perpetuity, right? Instances again and again and again and again and again, I'm gonna keep numbering them. So infinity plus 99, not, not recognize that infinity is uh, not a species of finitude. And so God is also not a species of finitude. The, the largest imaginable finitude is God. No, it's, it's a categorical mistake to understand that. He's not uh, perpetuity. He's infinite. Perpetuity, Lewis says, is only the attainment of an endless series of moments which e each lost as soon as it is attained. Eternity is the actual and timeless flu flu fruition of illimitable life. Now this is why the language of cause and effect is problematic with God, because it suggests that he is a, an, a finite agent, right? It projects him uh, in terms of our understanding. As soon as you speak of God as causing things, it, we have to think of a finite being. However, grand, still finite, it's problematic. I mean, it's, it's using accommodationist language. <coughs> and as Lewis notes here, God is eternal, not perpetual. And then it's strictly speaking, he never foresees, he simply sees. Your future is only an area and only for us, a special area of his infinite now, his infinite now. It's all present for him because he's not bound by space and time. And therefore, he's not limited by our actions. Therefore, he has freedom, whereas we perceive it as there's no possible freedom because this, I, I'm stuck in this. I can't change my circumstances. God is always free, even in that, which is why you should pray to him, because he, those circumstances which appear to bind you and make you fated to whatever situation you're in are not binding him. nor do they bind you insofar as you draw nearer to him, right? Hence the power of prayer. It can actually break the laws of nature because the laws as such are not laws. They're simply inclinations and all the inclinations are connected to the God who inclines things to be that way and, and yet is not bound by those inclinations in the cosmos. Most people don't understand what it means that God is infinite. Lewis gets it. And so it's an important passage. I'll skip over that, and you can look at it yourself. I think it's, it's uh, quite powerful and interesting. But I want to move on to the heavens. And I'm going to have to go this, through this far more quickly than I originally intended. But he begins by saying that the fundamental concept of modern science is, or was till very recently, that of natural laws to repeat what I said a few minutes ago. And every event was described as happening in obedience to them furthermore. So the, the idea of law and obedience, th these are all anthropomorphisms, <coughs> right? Applying to a world without reason, like nobody thinks that animals, or well, some say animals, but certainly nobody thinks trees have reason, but applying an obedient will and a conscious mind to the world around us. This is it actually is a funny way of putting it. <coughs> Whereas in medieval science, the fundamental concept was that of certain sympathies, antipathies, and strivings inherent in matter itself. Everything has its right place, its home, the region that suits it, and if not forcibly restrained, moves thither by a sort of homing instinct. So a stone here will drop to the earth and then drop to the center of the earth. Furthermore, if it's not impeded, it'll be impeded by the ground. But if I dug a hole from this side of the earth all the way to the other side, there's a uh, 
medieval, I can't remember his name, a, a medievalist who said, where would it, would, would it go straight through and go to the other side of the world and, and off into the air on the other side? And he says, no, it would stop right in the middle of the earth. That's a very interesting idea. Where does he come up with this idea? But fascinating. I mean, he hasn't done an empirical experiment. As far as I know, modern science has not done the experiment either. But he has a sense that, there, that it goes towards the center of this planet. And it will stop there, because that's where everything is tending. That's the, the, the center of gravity, as it were. Everything falls to that center. And the only impediment, then, is a physical one. So you would keep dropping until you hit the center of the Earth, at which point you would no longer go any further, even if it, there was a hole all the way through it. And why an explanation of gravity is probably because in proximity to the sun, because the sun is the heaviest thing in the whole solar system. Even though it's made of largely of helium, which is the lightest gas, it's compressed so hard, so heavy, that it, all the planets revolve around the sun, which is an extraordinary thing, because it's the brightest thing as well. So the brightest and the lightest thing is also the heaviest because of the compression. It's, a, it's quite extraordinary. But that light, bright, and yet heavy thing, which causes what we call gravity, on, on the Earth, well, first of all, it keeps the Earth in the orbit of the Sun, that heaviness. And yet it's, it's a heaviness that's uh, just far enough away as not to draw us in towards it, because if we drew any closer to it, we'd be burned up. And yet, not far enough away that we would spiral away from it, and we would then experience global cooling on a very quick period, and we the Earth would be an uninhabitable. That same sense of gravity there also applies on the Earth, but there within internally, because things fall to the Earth, they don't fall towards the heaviest thing on the cosmos, which is the Sun. Right? We think about it. If that's the heaviest thing, it's so heavy that it moves the Earth, then why aren't things flying off the Earth to the Sun? Because it has its own little ecosystem. It draws towards the center. That's fascinating stuff. But it has, so the medieval way of this, expressing this is not through laws, but rather through sympathies and antipathies and strivings or inclinations. It, it inclines that way. A kindly inclining, inclining to their kindly steed, the earth, the center of the mundus. And so the iron, in uh, Francis Bacon's rendering, is in particular sympathy moveth, moveth towards the lodestone. You remember that, a magnet. You've done, remember the iron filings? And you, you do that in school still, right? You put them down and then you see the, what you can't see. Suddenly there's, oh, this is, and it has a certain pattern. It's beautiful the magnetic field. They perceive this. They just haven't been able to observe it, but they know that it's there. Well, that suggests a rational capacity which uh, exists in ob observing things without actually observing it as, as modern science has. And they are also aware, the, by the way, that the world is round or spherical. The, medieval, the idea that the medieval thought that the world was flat um, is flat wrong. Sorry. <coughs> and so this explains why medieval thinkers believe that what we now call inanimate objects, like this cup of coffee, uh, uh, were sentient and purposive. It sounds like, a, again, are they stupid? Do they think the cup of coffee has, you know, I can talk to the cup of coffee? No, it's sentient in the sense that it inclines, it tends to do certain things. And that we'll get to that more when we talk about the different types of souls. So there's a rational soul, which, anim which human beings have, and furthermore, which angels have. Uh, there is a sensitive soul, which animals have, and there's a vegetable soul, which vegetables have, as growth and so forth. We actually, human beings, and this is slightly confusing, have all three, because the properties of the vegetables are also ours, and the animals are also ours. We just have a third property that neither of the two has. By the way, animals also have vegetable souls, what we call animals. So I'm going to try and put this back up. This is the problem with not touching it. It disappears, but now I need it. <coughs> 
So let me skip over this uh, rather quickly. He does say this, um, to talk as if, 94, inanimate bodies had a homing instinct is to bring them no nearer to us than the pigeons. To talk as if they could, quote, obey laws is to treat them like men and even like citizens. So there's an immediate tendency as a consequence to take everything that happens in the world and to treat them as if they were no different than human beings which is why posthumanism is catching on at present, why rights are being attributed not only to uh, chimpanzees, but to the planet itself. Because all nature is nature. So there's this flat reduction of all nature to the same basic stuff, the lowest common denominator, which is what? A vegetable soul. It just grows. It survives. That's the lowest common denominator. So it's hardly surprising in our day that rationality, even the laws of logic, logic are being disputed within academia itself. Law of non-contradiction. It's regularly contradicted within the academy. I gave illustrations earlier. But it, let, let's follow through this. He says, it, so it's, it's to talk as if these bodies had a home in, instinct is to bring them no nearer to us than the pigeons. So it's, it's actually, although it sounds like it's anthropomorphizing, there's actually a significant difference still there in the medieval mind. Whereas, as soon as we talk about obedience and obeying laws, we anthropomorphize everything. So he flips the charge against the medieval. So they, these idiots were talking about rocks as if they had uh, a homing instinct. How crazy. Like, what's wrong with Aristotle? He flips it around. Actually, our way of talking about things makes everything as if it were a person. Crazy. And uh, let me carry on. But though neither statement can be taken literally, it, it does not follow that it makes no difference which, which is used. So neither is to be taken literally. That's true. But when it is used, it does matter which one you imagine is to be true. On the imaginative and emotional level, it makes a great difference whether with the medievals, we project upon the universe our strivings and desires, or with the moderns, our police system and our traffic regulations. Makes a great deal of difference. Because, well, we'll push it to contemporary examples. We can talk about violating nature. You know, the atrocity done to the natural world by our carbon footprints, etc., as if nature were a person, as if her rights had been abrogated, the rights of nature, just like the laws of nature, as if nature were personified. The old language continually suggests a sort of continuity between merely physical events and our most spiritual aspirations. If, in whatever sense, the soul comes from heaven, our appetite for beatitudes is itself an instance of kindly inclining for the kindly steed. So our, our, our zelige zehnsucht that I mentioned last time, our blessed desires for heaven, which we see in human strivings in life, their desire for love, their desire for happiness, their desire for justice, all of these things are desires for a place that is other than the place in which we find ourselves. And he explains utopias based on this. The reason that we, and, and, and when it comes to Narnia, the reason that we love the old Narnia is it reminded us of this place, right, right towards the end, the last battle. And, and there's a, 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 within the human breast, there is a striving for that blessedness which we've lost, the communion with God. Uh, Augustine calls it what? Um, he says uh, in his confessions, Lord, uh, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find our, their rest in you. So there's this inclination, a striving, and it, it's, it has psychological ex explanation. It also explains not just our, our most uh, praiseworthy inclinations, but also our least um, praiseworthy actions like addictions and abuses. Right? It, it's ex explained in terms of love and inclination. So he says, the ultimately sympathetic and antipathetic properties in matter are the four contrary. So let me go over these because you'll never have heard them. 
the four contraries, uh, he cites Chaucer here um, uh, as six, but I'll just give the four. Hot, cold, moist, and dry. No, that's not the four elements. Those are the four properties. The four contraries. Hot, cold, moist, and dry. We meet them in Milton's chaos, raw, because chaos is not the universe, but only its raw material. In the mundus which God built out of that raw material, we find them only in combination. And how do they combine? As the four elements. Now these you know, earth, air, fire, and water. So, the union of hot and dry, these, uh, these two contraries, becomes fire. Fires are hot and dry. Two contrary properties, they coalesce in that. That of hot and moist, the air. That of uh, cold and moist, water. Of cold and dry, earth. In the human body, they combine with a different result, as we shall see later. Well, what is that later? It's going to be the, um, the psychological explanation. I'm going to skip over. I'm going to go to that right now, if I can. Um, or at least mention, these are the doctrine of the four humors. And I'll just mention them here, because otherwise I'm not going to get to them at all. Um, in our day, we talk about uh, psychological profiles. You will do the uh, Myers-Briggs, and it'll tell you what sort of personality you have. Right? And they will distinguish that there are different types of personality. They're trying to, uh, uh, trying to explain what we observe for ourselves, that some people are just by nature, by, not even by circumstances. Some people are grumpy. <laughs> some people are cheerful. Some people are morose. Some people are sullen. Some people are prone to be sad. Right? This th just seems to be not, it's not even related to circumstances, although circumstances can push them away from their natural inclination. So some children are from their early beginnings very cheerful, right? And always upbeat, energetic, whatever. The explanation here will be connected to two things. One, these contraries and, their, and the, uh, your, the elemental properties that you have in your body. Like everyone has the same elemental properties, but there's a different combination, a different and that's further connected to where you, under what star you were born, what planet. And it will be associated with it. So, just very briefly, the proportion of the humors is never exactly the same in any two individuals. The complexions can obviously be grouped into four main types, according to the humor that predominates in each. So, one of the symptoms of a man's complexion is his coloring. We would talk about pigmentation, skin color, or in modern uh, Darwinistic terms, his race, which is thoroughly problematic. In the Christian conception, there's only one race, and it's the human race. But in Darwinian, it's related to your, com your complexion. These are different races. But in the modern sense, it's complexion. But I do not think the word ever had that sense in Middle English. That their word for what we call complexion was rode. As in the Miller's tale, his rode was reed, his iron gray as goose. <laughs> Where blood predominates, we have the sanguine complexion. This is the best of the four. Where do we get? So blood is, so what I talked about the humor. Let me mention the humors then. So I talked about the contraries. I talked about the four elements. Let's talk about the four humors. Hot and moist make blood. Hot and dry, it's on 170, 71 if you want to look it up after. Hot and dry, color, as in choleric, C-H-O-L-E-R. Hot and moist, phlegm. You know the stuff that you spit up, that phlegm? That's also a, a, a humor. You're phlegmatic. You're lazy. M cold and dry, melancholy. Those four are the four uh, humors. Now, where do we get this? These also relate to complexions. Where blood predominates, we have the sanguine complexion. Sanguine, the word sang there is for blood. Same in, in French, it's song, right? Sanguine. But it's the best of the four. So to, be a, a, to have a sanguine humor, to have too much blood or to be inclined towards the blood, uh, has very positive Association. So, um, 
what are the signs of a sanguine man? Well, he quotes from uh, Thomas, Sir Thomas Eliot. He says, the sanguine man has visage white and ruddy, he sleeps much, dreams of bloody things or things pleasant, angry shortly. The dreams, I take it, says Lewis, are not of wounds and strife so much as blood red colors. The pleasant things are what we would call merry. The sanguine man's anger is easily roused, but short-lived. So yes, he can fly off the handle, but he cools down just as quickly. He doesn't remain angry. The pleasant things are merry. He is, uh, he's a trifle peppery, but not sullen or vindictive. So there's a temper, but he's not vindictive. He doesn't hold a grudge. So he's explained all, and I'm not going to go through all of them there, but th then he goes on to the choleric man, uh, the melancholy, and the phlegmatic. And they're all described there, and these are connected um, imaginatively and connected with the heavens as well, because the certain, the, the certain temperaments are connected with certain gods who have these same characteristics. So, so Jove, Jupiter is understandably jovial. Right? To this day, we use the term, he's cheerful. Well, this would be a sanguine temperament, and so forth. Anyway, what it's explaining is the, in a, the unity of human nature, and at the same time, the vast differences that we notice between people. They're giving a biological, astronomical explanation for the discipline we now call psychology, which didn't exist until the 20th century. as such. And that will have effect on their medicine then as well. So if you're, if you have a fever, you got too much blood and you're hot, right? So it's got the contrary properties, right? And, and so the, uh, the therapy for it is bleeding. Stick the leeches on you or they can cup you and all that stuff. That start, stuff that's starting to come back. Uh, Lewis says this is not good medicine. It's not good science, but it has an imaginative resonance and there is probably some truth to it and it explains things that we can't explain. Why are people psychologically so distinct and different? Why are, why are all people not cheerful and is there something wrong with the people that aren't cheerful? Do they all need to be fixed and given a happy pill? Because that's if you look at modern science fiction, Brave New World, they're given Soma. Uh, a chemical additive to make them happy. Modern psychology pops pills. They give you a pill to make you a certain psychological profile. Well, what's wrong? What, what happens if there's your psychological profile is not anything other than one of those four and you're just naturally phlegmatic or you're naturally choleric, etc. It's trying to make everything into one human nature with one temperament. Never mind. So backtracking, he says it makes a great deal of difference on an emotional and imaginative level. So the four elements, I talked about this. Let's go back to the cosmo cosmology. In the sublunary world, so the lunae there, you can perhaps see it, represented by a, a semicircle there. That's that sphere. So this is the Ptolemaic cosmology. Uh, it is geocentric. So the geo, uh, the earth from which we get geography is at the center of this cosmology. And around it are concentric spheres. And I say spheres, they're not just circles, they're spheres. So this is a two-dimensional diagram. It's, it's better to see it as if it were three-dimensional and that's a little bit of a sense of it like that. But we'll stick with the flat one for now. The, the moon is an influence on the earth. Now, how do they actually observe that empirically? Well, they observe in terms of tides. When the moon is a little bit closer and it's a full moon, you will, you will notice the effects, the inclinations on, of those who are on earth. They will be inclined towards the moon. The moon, as we know, is mutable. It changes, it waxes, it wanes. The people under the influence of the moon will be more prone to lunacy as we call it. Irrational behavior. 
It has an effect. We can notice its effect on the tides. The, the water will rise and fall. If you're close to the, uh, the, the, the seas or the ocean even, go to the Bay of Fundy in Newfoundland. I mean, the tides can rise by 20 odd feet or so forth in proximity to the moon. So they notice that there is a genuine influence there. What laws are being, is it observing? I've never even heard, there's, I'm sure there's a, a law that uh, is now ascribed to that, although I don't know it, but the inclination is the moon's having its influence on the Earth. They will say the same thing which is easy to observe in the moon is in all of the other constellations as well. And with those planets is an intelligence, and an intelligence as an, an angelic being. And by the way, the angelic beings are all good up here, but on Earth they're perceived not necessarily so. The perception of their influence is not so, but they are in their being. These, in, these uh, angels are actually good in their nature. But that was going back to Pseudo Dionysius where he talked about the nine orders of the angels, etc. Go back and look into that if you want. But the influence of all these. So I talked about inclination. So each has, a, a, has an effect uh, on the earth, the influence of Mars in relation to this has certain consequences. I, I mean, he, he lists the, it here. But at the, uh, at, at the center, we see the Earth. And then we see the water on top of the Earth. And then we see the air above that. And then above that is the realm of fire. So the four elements. And if you notice what fire does, if you burn it, it goes up. Right? The flames go up. Un they, so they oppose the law of gravity. Everything else goes down, but, lo but fire inclines upwards. You light a fire, it doesn't go down. It goes up. So they posit a realm of fire above the... So you look up to the air and you see light up there. Uh, and they even... If at sunset, it looks like there's a light around. Well, that's the realm of fire. Now above that, above the air, is the ether. And they, as I say, the dividing line as such is the moon. At the moon beyond that is ether. And there are beings in that world. There's also be, there are beings in the air. And the spirits of the air are the daemones and Satan being the prince of those spirits of the air. You can't see him. doesn't mean he's not there. That's where he resides. So to be caught up in the air is to be caught up in the realm below the moon in the medieval understanding. Imaginatively, they're not actually saying he is there. Remember, they, the medieval, for poetic purposes, it's powerful. It, it helps them understand. It does not mean that they understand it in the same way we understand science, scientifically. They find it helpful. You, I mean, your kids will ask you, where's God? Where is he? You used to talk about God all the time. Where is he? And you say, well, he's, he's up in heaven. Like, well, where is that? That's <laughs> And where's hell? Where are these places that are, are spoken of? One answer is, well, they're, they're nowhere. That might not be a bad explanation in the sense that heaven is not a spatial, temporal place. If God is said to, be, to reside there and God is not subject to space and time, heaven in that sense is not a place. I mean, place is almost a category mistake. And where the child is asking for a response that accommodates that, but try explain that. <laughs> it's not an easy one. On the other hand, you can say if God is not uh, um, bound by space and time, he's everywhere. Also, there's nowhere where, it's, where God's spirit is not present. But again, these are more challenging things for uh, for not small children, but they immediately ask the question of location. And they're asking for something that will conform to their imagination, so the way things operate and so forth. Anyway, um, so that's the uh, influence. Now, all of these, they go beyond that in the realm of fire into the, um, and the element of fire, which is put out by new philosophy. I'll skip over that. But I will Go to 98 and 99, and then I'm going to go towards the end of this just to summarize and move on. He says, for thought and imagination. So the medieval model, first of all, is vertiginous. The earth is really at the center. Remember that you now have an absolute up and down for the medieval mind. 
There's an absolute up. Actually, I'll read his whole section because I, I, my attempt to abbreviate it makes it confusing. These facts are in themselves curiosities of med mediocre interest. They become valuable only insofar as they enable us to enter more fully into the consciousness of our ancestors by realizing how such a universe must have affected, as in the passions, the feelings, the emotions, affected those who believed in it. The recipe for such realization is not the study of books. You must go out on a starry night and walk about for half an hour trying to see the sky in terms of the old cosmology. I, when I read this, then I did this myself. In England, I went out, walked, went to the Lake District, looked up where there's no light pollution and so forth. Areas north of here, up Muskoka perhaps, and so forth. It's really dark at night, so you can, the stars are very bright and seem very close. Remember that you now have an absolute up and down. The Earth is really the center, really the lowest place. Movement to it from whatever direction is downward movement. As a modern, you located the stars at a great distance. For distance, you must now substitute that very special and far less abstract sort of distance, which we call height. How tall is it? Sounds like an odd thing. How tall is the sky? But that's how they conceived of it, as a height and not a distance. Height, which immediately speaks to our muscles and nerves. The medieval model is vertiginous, makes you almost collapse at the idea of the height. And the fact that the height of the stars in the medieval astronomy is very small compared with their distance in the modern will turn out not to have the kind of importance you anticipated. For thought and imagination, 10 million miles and 1,000 million are much the same. It's the difference. It's a very big height. It's a long distance. Both can be conceived, that is, we can do sums with both, and neither can be imagined. It's so large, it's so vast. And the more imagination we have, the better we shall know this. The really important difference is that the medieval universe, while unimaginably large, was also unambiguously finite. Whereas God was infinite, their cosmos was finite. It's a small thing as large it is, as it is to us, even in the medieval mind. Like, it's, it's fast, you look up, and it, it's huge. And yet, it's a finite thing. It's something created. And one unexpected result of this is to make the smallness of Earth more vividly felt. There's a sense of humility that descends on people as a consequence of this, which goes away in the modern view, where we think we're so important. They never thought that in the medieval period. In our universe, she is small, no doubt, but so are the galaxies, so is everything, and so what? But in theirs, there was an absolute standard of comparison. The furthest sphere, Dante's Maggior Corpo, is quite simply and finally the largest object in the universe. Furthest out. The word small as applied to Earth thus takes on a far more absolute significance. Again, because the medieval universe is finite, it has a shape, the perfectly spherical shape containing within itself an ordered variety. So there's a unifying concept and yet there's diversity within the unity. And there's a, there's a, a ratio there as well. And the ratio is that of that of music. So the music of the spheres. I'll come to this in a minute. But there, hence, to look out on the night sky with modern eyes is like looking out over a sea that fades away into mist, or looking about one in a trackless forest, trees forever and no horizon. To look up at the towering medieval universe is much more like looking at a great building. The space of modern astronomy may arouse terror or bewilderment or vague reverie the spheres of the old present us with an object in which the mind can rest, overwhelming in its greatness 
but satisfying in its harmony. That is the sense in which our universe is romantic and theirs was classical. So note that, even the reference to that. So this Ptolemaic model is the classical conception. The new one, the Copernican one, in which there is space outside of us. So you look out and you look out into space, is he calls that the romantic model. Now he uses that term and I think it, it has an analogy with romantic poetics and romantic notions of creativity, which is absolute creativity ex nihilo, because it's out of the space of nothingness. Now it also gives a sense, and he mentions this as well, a very modern experience which, which there is no record of in the ancient world or the medieval world, namely the fear of, uh, or the anxiety of being out in the open, agoraphobia. Why do people, why are people afraid of being outside or being alone? Because they think that they are alone. There's nothing around them. In the medieval model, they ha they, they're never alone. They never think they're alone. Everything is inclined towards them by love. Everything. Even the planets. Everything in the earth is moved by love. The modern conception sees us as autonomous, laws of ourselves, laws unto ourselves. There is nothing outside of us. Or even more alarmingly, the, the um, scenario which is envisaged in 18th century lit literature, and uh, if you want a book on this, it's, it's, a, it's an English book, but it's called, uh, by A.D. Nuttall, it's called An Uncommon Sky. And he talks about the fiction of the 18th century, imagining that the world outside of us may not really exist. So the, uh, you'll know this uh, scenario from Descartes. What if the people outside of me don't really exist? He presents it as a hypothesis. It's more than a hypothesis in the modern mind. They actually think we actually conceive of others uh, as having a more dubious hold on reality than ourselves. It's a very much of an internal landscape. It's a, it's a self-absorption. It's a turn inward. We think that the psyche is the center of the humanities and psychology thereby, rather than be having a similar connection to the world as the other humanities. So in Christian universities even, psychology is the sort of the leading discipline. Because the internal world is so valued. But with that, the lives of others are, I would say, commensurately devalued. But this leads to pe all sorts of anxieties and so forth. Phobias. We derive our identity then, not on the basis of a common human nature and a common world and a God who influences all of those things, but rather on our own self-identity, so we have to self-declare. And then what will we use to form that identity? Well, rather than being in the Imago Dei, he will have to declare that our, we have certain inclinations of our desires, and that will be our identity. And th of those identities, there is such a pro proliferation, there's almost no end to them. And it's even at odd, odds with our physical nature. So my gender identity is what I'm talking about here, as opposed to my sex can be, it has no relation whatsoever. I would regard it as a category mistake, a total confusion, but it's just an illustration of what he's talking about here. It doesn't lead people to feel more settled or more uh, having a greater sense of self. It leads to a terrific sense of anxiety and alienation. That's the effect of the cosmology imaginatively. I'm not even getting into, like, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a psychologist, not, I'm just talking, he, this is what he's talking about. I think he's correct. This, is, this explains why all sense of the pathless, the baffling, and the utterly alien. Now, why don't they talk about aliens in the medieval period? Why do they talk them about them in the modern? Why do they talk about space travel before people travel into space? Because they do. First manned space flight is in 1969. 
but you can see space travel in the 19th century. Can imagined. Why is it being imagined? And why is it called space, a vacuous, empty thing? There's nothing there. It's an emptiness. And furthermore, think about this. If God is said to be out there, out there, up there, and you go out there and there's space there, what is your conception of God that comes from that? He's nothing. Now, I say this because when we come to Lewis's um, uh, fictional work, The Great Divorce, he is going to go after that conception that God is nothing, is a fantasy. It's connected to this whole link of thoughts that he's established here. Can you see that at least? At least some, that's why I wanted to begin with this before we move to those things. You, I want you to f try and imagine and feel what he's talking about when he comes to these things because I think he conveys it in his fiction. But if you actually understand he's describing the medieval model and just importing it into his fiction, I think it's even that much more powerful. So while the moral and emotional consequences of the cosmic dimensions were emphasized, the visual consequences were sometimes ignored. So they, having put this model there, they didn't actually think that it described it physically. So that's, uh, anyway. But I will, uh, I will go off uh, and move on from that. And he will describe the different varying planets. So look for yourself on 105, Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and Sol and Mercury and so forth. And the Luna, the moon, and everything beneath the moon is mutable, subject to the fall. Everything above the moon, no longer so, not subject to the fall. And thereby preserving what we call the laws of nature. The, the fact that they're under the moon means that the, what we call the laws of nature are sometimes contradicted by change. The fall changes everything there, but up above not so much. But the premium mobile outside of this, the prime mover, is the thing that moves everything. Now, on the outside, he moves it, and it's very quick. And he moves it in one direction. So I have to put it up here because I have a very short leash today. And uh, if I want to put the cosmology here, and I'll just do it like this, and just do four. Um, the one moves in this direction. So the prime mover, which is God, the love of God moves everything. And he moves one sphere in this direction. When he moves it in that direction, uh, and it moves at great speed, it encounters a movement in the opposite direction. And the one, as we know, just from resistance, wind resistance, it slows the other down. So it hits a, a resistance. Or so just think of water. So if you push water towards somebody and then somebody pushes the water back, the water sort of the re meets a resistance there. That's what's happening there. And this happens repeatedly in all of these things. And contrary, for and when they do this, the spheres oscillate. And when they oscillate, they make a music, a celestial music, the music of the spheres. It's referred to repeatedly in English hymnody and so forth, all the way into the 19th century. And from the, the music of those spheres, we derive the musical scale, the octave, upon which Western music is built. And it's mathematically precise. So this is going to be the foundation for the quadrivium. Music is one of the four elements of the seven liberal, liberal arts, along with mathematics, along with geometry, along with astronomy. Those four things are the quadrivium. Now, they are broken utterly by the medieval model, other than music. Music is not broken, because you can't do music otherwise. Actually, it starts to break in the Romantic movement, but that's for a different reason. They still use octaves. They're building on the old musical system. It's still harmonious. If you try and deviate from this, it just doesn't sound good. This discord results. Mathematics has, as, as of yet, as far as I know, not been considered to be altered by a personal identity group. It, not yet. Ma it hasn't gone into mathematics yet, but it's, it's going that way at which point total anarchy breaks out. But anyway, um, I will skip all, all over that just for sake of time. I, I, I love it. I think it's so interesting. Um, 
But the idea of God as a lover moving all of these things is, uh, has the effect of influence. And influence is the way in which the heavens move what, below, uh, what happens below. Now, it doesn't do it definitively. So they look up to the heavens and they predict what's going to happen in the future on the basis of the constellation of the planets. And they predict well sometimes. That's what the Magi were doing. Note that they were off by about six months. They arrived late. Who were the first people that got there? The shepherds. It's very interesting. I mean, it's almost ironic. So the Magi that come from the east, the wise men, they show up way late. They get it wrong. It's not actually emphasized in the scripture there, but if you're reading it carefully, it's funny. The, the lowest station in the to on the totem pole of occupations in that world was the shepherds. They got there first, the common people. Whereas the wise men, they showed up too. They just showed very late for the party. Um, and so when Herod says, okay, we'll kill everyone under two. Why everyone under two? Because he wants to be careful, but uh, he's way off. They, they're up and out of there by that point. And anyway, never mind. But so the cosmology, um, I will skip over that. The longevity, I'm going to have to skip over that, but he talks at, at, at length about fairies and elves here, which Tolkien also talks about in his uh, essay on fairy. And so elves are, uh, have various import depending on the author, but they are most certainly not little pixie Tinkerbell characters. I mean, to say that. Um, they are genuine sp and they're spiritual powers, and to some degree, um, uh, they're contradictory in the way that they're described by different authors. But I'll just skip right over that. But in some renderings, there are a third species distinct from angels and men. That will probably be more like Tolkien's conception. In others, they're fallen angels, so they're devils. So elves are, you know, people are a little uncertain about elves. For some, they're the dead that have risen up and so forth. So elves really have quite scary connotation. Let's talk, let, let me skip forward though. I'm going to go over the earth and its inhabitants because now I am very short on time. And I want to talk about, and I'm going to skip over to where's the page, uh, to the earth and her inhabitants. I want to go to the rational soul. No, the human soul. So this is page 152. Man is a rational animal. So says Aristotle. And therefore a composite being. Because those, it has two description. He's rational and an animal. The uh, angels are also rational, but they're not animals. But a rational animal means he's a composite being. Partly akin to the angels who are rational, but on the later scholastic view, not animal. And partly akin to the beasts, which are animal, but not rational. This gives us one of the senses in which he is the little world or the microcosm. So that's the macrocosm. In John Donne, he says that I'm a little world made cunningly with an angel-like sprite. But every mode of being in the whole universe contributes to a person. So when uh, Don again in one of his, I think it's a sermon, says that no man uh, is an island. And ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee and so forth. So if anything happens to another person, it also affects him. He's, he's leaning on this idea that we're all partaking of a general nature and so forth. But he says, every mode of being in the whole universe contributes to him. He is a cross-section of being. So that, the descriptions, and he breaks this down here. Rational soul is not the only kind of soul. There are also two more. Sensitive soul, vegetable soul. In reverse order then. The powers of vegetable soul are nutrition, growth, and propagation. Note that all plant life does this. Note that all animal life does this. Note that all human life does this. Nutrition, growth, propagation.
But for the vegetable life, that's the only type of soul it has. We'll move up to the animal type. Sensitive soul, which we find in animals, has these powers, but has sentience in addition. It's conscious. It thus includes and goes beyond vegetable soul, so that a beast can be said to have two levels of soul, sensitive and vegetable, or a double soul, or even, misleadingly, two souls. So rational soul, similarly, so the third, similarly includes vegetable and sensitive and adds reason. So this is the distinctive feature of man. Mankind has a vegetable soul in the sense that uh, it, uh, we require nutrition, we require we, we grow and we propagate ourselves. We, that's part of being uh, human. We also are conscious. And finally, and this is what distinguishes mankind from the other animals, we have reason. Now, what we mean by reason, on the other hand, and by the way, all three kinds of soul are immaterial. You can't observe them directly. You can see, the co the, the, you can see that they're there. You can see that plants grow, that you can observe. But what it is that makes the growth, you don't know. I don't think scientists have even now explained what makes a plant grow. You know, these conditions create this. Yeah, but what actually makes it grow? For the uh, medieval mind, it's inclination. It inclines towards that. That's, it just, like, that's not an explanation either, but at least it's, it's moved by love tends towards this. But the soul, the life of a tr herb or a tree is not part of it which would be found in dissection. Nor is the rational soul of a mankind a part. So you cut a person up and you find the soul. You're not going to do that because it's immaterial. The peculiarity of rational soul, he says, is that it is created in each case by the immediate act of God. Now this is the distinctive feature. So the three things have a commonality, and the one that's distinct to human beings as opposed to animals is that it has reason. But mankind, unlike the other thing, does not follow what we call the laws of nature. Mankind has a, each individual case is caused by an immediate act of God. Immediate, there's no mediation. It can't be pointed to a natural cause. There's an intervention. It breaks the laws of nature. You might say that human beings propagate themselves the same way that uh, the vegetable world was through uh, spermatozoa and, and, and the ovum, which is true. But that doesn't account for what's distinct there. And that reasonable thing, that part of the Imago Dei, that comes from God. The way scripture speaks of it is God breathes his life into mankind, takes it out. So Genesis 2 verse 7 is the source of this, but he says Plato also set the creation of man apart from creation in, gen in general. So there's this distinctive feature there, and it's an individual one in the Christian conception. Now this, so the soul's turning to God is often treated in the poets as a, re as a returning. But this is, th this is all going to have a large effect on uh, what happens when we die, which is an apologetic question. And this is worth reading. The inconvenience of making the rational soul begin to exist only when the body begins to exist. And also holding that it existed after the body's death was palliated by the reminder that death, one of those quote unquote two things that were never made. Did God create, did God make death? Did God make sin? These are not his creations. Milton depicts them as uh, springing from Satan's head. Left side, actually. Sin springs out of Satan's head. And then from that and their sexual relations, death comes out and so forth. So these come from not from God, but from one of his beings. This is the one thing that God did not create. God did not make sin and he did not make death. These were derived from other beings. So this is important. These things were never made and they had no place in the original creation, neither sin nor death, right? 
Death inter entered our world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restores, says Milton. Did not, was not there before. It was a consequence of disobedience. Okay. It is not the soul's nature to leave the body. So it wasn't created so that these things would separate. But after the fall, because of sin, they do. But in their original state, the soul and the body would have stayed together and they would not have died, furthermore. Or more, entropy would not have taken place, furthermore. It is not the soul's nature to leave the body. Rather, the body, disnatured by the fall, deserts the soul. It deserts the soul at the point of death. It's not the other way around. The soul doesn't desert the body. The body deserts the soul. That rational element, that conscious element, that element of us that is distinctly human, it remains. The body deserts us when we die. The soul remains. God beholds the soul. What happens to us? If you are a, uh, in the materialist end of things, uh, he, he actually notes this, and I thought it's quite a glorious passage. I don't know if I'm going to find it right now. George Barclay has the problem of the mind-body connection as well, right? And, and he posits that there's only intellectual things, and there's no, the physical nature doesn't really exist. The modern materialist has the exact opposite problem. There's no such thing as the soul, the reason. These are just chemical processes. So what we call thinking is actually just a form of thinking that we're thinking, and it's a chemical thing. It's a, it's a delusion. This comes to sort of, and I didn't even get to what was almost the more interest, most interesting part of all for me. Go on to 156 in the rational soul where he divides the intellect from the reason. We flip it the other way around. Let me give it, a, gosh, a 30 second synopsis. The intellect is, in man is like the angelic intelligence. Remember angelic uh, beings are called intelligences uh, with each star. These are fixed things, certitudes. And we move from understanding to reason. So on the basis of the fixed points of understanding, or I would call them the presuppositions, we then move to explore things that we can reason about. But we have reason as a higher category, or understanding rather as a higher category than reasoning. Kant inverts the two and says that reasoning is the highest power. But as it is explained here, the difference between them for the medievalist is like the difference between rest and motion or between possession and acquisition. Modern reason, post Kant, is always acquiring things but never maintaining anything. It holds nothing. It takes a tabula rasa to all and is always trying to reason through things but has no fixities. It's a revolutionary way of thinking. It flips in the understanding of the intellect and the reason on its head. I think it has untold consequences. He's exploring this here. I think there's much work for me to be done in writing on this because I don't think it's much has been said on this subject, but it's very important. Coleridge also follows Kant in this ridiculous inversion as well. But you have to, in order to think, have to have certain certainties, like say the laws of logic to hold. They have to be there. In order to use your reason, you have to have certain certainty. So what he talks about is there's a reduction of what we now call reasoning to the mere um, process of thinking, but with no certainties there, including the certainty of human nature and God's existence and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, that I have to skip all over that just because I've run out of time. Apologies for that. Uh, I will give a summary statement next time when we move on to our next work, and I'll talk about the epilogue, so his summary of this, so just to sort of tie the bow up, and then we'll move on, okay?